Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Welcome to the Modern Website Engineering for Stacked Subsetting Tools for Advanced Analysis of Airborne Chemistry Data webinar. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. It's 2 p.m. Eastern Time, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. And what I'd like to do first is go over just a few logistics related to today's webinar. To ensure the best audio experience, participants have been placed in silent mode. But if you have any issues or you have any questions, what I'd like for you to do is enter those into the Q&A pod located on the right-hand side of your screen. And again, this works like a chat. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording will be posted to our online Adobe Connect webinar catalog, as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a couple of days of completion. And once we uh, reach the end of today's webinar, I will um, provide a link uh, to those locations, and I will send an email to all registrants with the recording link. Regarding timing, today's webinar will be one hour long with 45 minutes allocated to the presentation and live demonstration and an additional 15 minutes for the question and answer period. Once our speakers have finished with their presentations, we will transition to a set of optional polling questions. And we'll give these questions two to three minutes or so, and then from there we'll move directly into the Q&A period. Depending upon the volume of questions that are received, we will extend the Q&A period an additional 15 minutes to 3.15 p.m. for those of you who may wish to stay on the line. Okay, during today's webinar, we have two speakers. Well, what I'll do now is pull up the agenda for everybody. Our first speaker, Dr. Makan Verdi, is the DAC scientist at the NASA Atmospheric Science Data Center Distributed Active Archive Center, or ASDC DAC. He will begin today's webinar with a general introduction to ASDC, its data holdings, and airborne field campaign. From there, we will transition to our second speaker, Dr. Damian Gessler, a computational scientist and NASA-affiliated contractor for ASDC. And he is going to provide a live demonstration of the advanced analysis of airborne chemistry data web application. And then what we'll do is we'll switch gears for the second part of his presentation to really dive into the hows and whys of stacked web engineering. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce, introduce today's first speaker, Dr. Makan Verdi. Makan? Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Makan Verdi. Uh, we are presenting this webinar to you from the Atmospheric Science Data Center at the NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. Uh, the goal of today's webinar is to provide an introduction to a web application that enables users to download data collected from NASA's airborne missions. We'll have a live demo, as Jennifer mentioned in the agenda. The primary goal of this talk is to show how such an application is created from an engineering perspective. Damien later will focus on full stack uh, web, uh, website architecture and the technology used for development of this web application. Uh, before we start with the demo and the technical aspects of the web application, I would like to give a brief introduction to our data center and our data holdings. For those who are new to NASA's Earth Observing System and the DAX in general. NASA has uh, 12 distributed active archive centers, or DACs, located throughout the United States. These centers are custodians of data from NASA's Earth Observing System, uh, otherwise called EOS. These DACs ensure that the data will be easily accessible to the users. Accessibility is one of the main features of today's web application demo, as you will see later when Damien uh, gives a demo. Each DAC has a discipline area for our DAC. We have a specialty in the atmospheric science data, which are collected from satellite missions, computer models, and field campaigns. Field campaigns include data from airborne campaigns, too, uh, and it is the focus of today's webinar. Our center, Atmospheric Science Data Center, currently hosts data from more than 900 data products, which are generated from over 44 different science projects, including satellite missions, field campaigns. Uh, the atmospheric science data available at ASDC can be broadly categorized in four themes, uh, which are radiation budget, uh, which takes into account the sum of all radiation transferred in all directions throughout Earth's atmosphere and to and from the space. Uh, one example instrument is the series data, which you might be familiar with. 
Another theme area is clouds. Uh, another one is aerosols. And then tropospheric chemistry, uh, which is the measurement of com chemical constituents in the atmosphere, including the major greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, methane, uh, and uh, nitrogen oxide. Uh, one of the instrument is MOPET, and we also have some upcoming missions like TEMPO and MAYA, which will focus on the pollution and particulate matter with a focus on human health studies. Uh, I encourage you to visit our website and learn more about these data, and I hope you will find these data useful in the atmospheric science research that you all are engaged in. Also, uh, for today's webinar, we are focusing on the importance of data and tools for airborne field campaigns. And uh, data for atmospheric science comes from a variety of sources, uh, like observations from satellites, airborne instruments, field sites, and computer models. So each of these different sources have pros and cons uh, relating to the spatial and the temporal coverage, and also the number of parameters or species that can be measured using each of these different platforms or sources of data. An integrated approach that involves data from all these different sources promotes the understanding of atmospheric processes, which help to mitigate air quality issues. And airborne observations are essential component of integrated observing system for atmospheric composition alongside the satellite and ground-based perspectives. They provide essential information for understanding the chemical and physical processes governing the vertical structure of the atmospheric composition with high temporal and spatial resolution. So data from uh, atmospheric missions can be very difficult to organize and discover. Uh, given the complexity of various instruments, a variety of parameters, a uh, general lack of consistent, uh, consistency of format standards in which such data is delivered, and also a difference in the spatial and temporal resolution and the sampling interval of these instruments. So uh, all this complexity makes uh, a necessary demand for a good discovery tool. A good data discovery tool is essential uh, for fully utilize, uh, utilizing the data from all these instruments from airborne missions. So using modern website engineering paradigms and frameworks can make it really easy uh, to create such tools and make life easier for both uh, developers who are engaged in creating such tools, and also for the end users like you all to, to um, use the data and spend more time doing the actual research uh, than trying to find the data. So uh, before we transition into the live demo, uh, I would like to thank uh, the principal investigators from various airborne field campaigns for providing all the information that we require to describe these data and also their support in creating the tools that make the data discovery easier for the end user. I would also like to acknowledge Dr. Gao Chen, who is also the PI for the web application. That is the focus of uh, today's webinar. And also uh, Morgan Silverman and uh, Crystal, who you'll be hearing uh, later in the slides from. Uh, with this, I will hand over uh, to Damien to introduce you to the features and capabilities of STAT and take you on a journey of modern website engineering. Uh, Damien Crystal, uh, take it away. Thank you, Makan. Uh, good afternoon uh, on the East Coast and a good uh, late morning to you um, uh, on the West Coast. My name is Damien Gessler. I am a uh, computational scientist, and I work at the nexus between science and informatics. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Santa Fe, New Mexico, and uh, Crystal uh, is going to share her screen, and she's going to drive uh, a live demo and the slide deck from uh, NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. Uh, so, Chris, if you uh, bring up the uh, excuse me, bring up the um, uh, the demo. Uh, what I thought we'd do today is just um, let's just hop right into it. Let's just kind of have dessert first. So, STACT, that's um, an acronym for Subsetting Tools for Advanced Analysis of Airborne Chemistry Data, is an Access uh, Award-winning proposal, and this is the work. Uh, um, uh, uh, for that uh, project. So let's hop right into what we're trying to achieve on this proposal, and that is to allow the discovery, ordering, and retrieval of data based on a spatial-temporal uh, front end. Um, and if we look at this uh, website right now, uh, on the left-hand side is a list of missions and platforms, what we call campaigns, and on the right-hand side, uh, a world map. 
Uh, Crystal, you're driving. If you select for us, let's say, uh, discover a queue in uh, Maryland, please. So when she selects on that campaign, the map zooms in and goes back to the server and brings back the flight tracks of the flight that we're flowing to um, uh, uh, select that data. Uh, Chris, if we go to the left, let's um, just open up uh, the, that's right, the pull down, and we can, a user can pick individual flights and uh, the particular flights that on that campaign. If we go back to the map, as Crystal hovers over in a particular flight, we'll see the information pop up on the right comes, and as she moves her mouse over that, that information is um, highlighted. Now, as these flights uh, fly, they are collecting uh, airborne samples for measurement data of various chemical species. And uh, in a large part, they do it by vertical spirals up or down to collect um, uh, samples in one particular space. Uh, that's called a vertical profile. And Chris, if you turn on the vertical profiles, uh, then a request goes back to the server. And the vertical profiles are originally clustered because there's hundreds of them. And you can click on that and begin to zoom in a little bit and see the particular vertical profiles, uh, the flights that were taken to collect information at that time. Um, let's uh, go ahead and uh, close uh, the uh, vertical profiles. And if we look down near the lower right of the screen just a little bit, yeah, that's a perfect position for the screen, you'll see it has a total of 93 records available. Uh, Crystal, let's now close the campaign for Discovery Q+. Okay. When we close the campaign, the map is updated, the variables are updated, and there's a total of about 3,007 variables uh, in the database. Now, let's say we didn't particularly know which campaign we wanted. We had a general idea of what we want to do is we want to just select in the general area. So you could click on the circle icon and make a um, radius of a particular circle that we want to look at. So we'll make some radius here. And then you can move the circle around just a little bit to the center point. And as she moves the circle around, we can see that the latitude and longitude of the circle is updated as we interact with the app. Let's go and make the circle uh, 100 kilometers so we can edit uh, the lat, long, or radius. And here we'll just do the radius, move to that position. And now let's get all flights in that area. Click on a button. Request goes back to the server. This was only four flights. Maybe we'll move the uh, circle crystal a little bit closer um, uh, to the Washington, D.C. area, and let's grab a few more flights. Yeah, let's move it a little bit closer there and get flights again and get a new selection of flights. As we just, there we go. Three more, and if we get it even closer, we'll pick up another large group. Pick up another 22 tracks. And what you'll notice is as the tracks come in, the information on the left is updated, and the information down below now 856 variables um, uh, updates in this very uh, interactive manner. So if we scroll the uh, uh, page down a little bit, the table that we're looking at, this main table, is the total number of variables that were collected across those flights. And as different principal investigators collect different types of data, they may name those variables, uh, those, that is the measurement of those chemical species, by their own idiosyncratic names that are driven by the requirements of their own projects. What we'd like to do, though, is map those more to a notion of common names. And Dr. Gao Chen has spent uh, uh, quite some time developing a common name schema. And this is what you're seeing on the left-hand side in that common name table. Now, um, on the further left, we have filter by term, filter by category. Let's do filter by category, Crystal. Let's choose uh, trace gases, for example. And when you select trace gases, this ontological classification of these uh, um, uh, uh, gases has gone in. We see the to total number of records is now down to uh, uh, from above 800 to 364. In the lower uh, left of the table is the number of records retrieved. And as Crystal scrolls down through the table without pressing any buttons, requests are sent back to the server, and records 20 at a time are sent automatically. 
uh, if we move the mouse over filter by instrument and technique, as we move over the various instruments, we can see a description of the instrument highlights that follows the mouse hover. Let's restrict these variables a little bit. Let's say we want to look at nitrogen dioxide and carbon dioxide. So let's type in NO2 and select. And uh, the table is filtered now down to eight variables. If we weren't doing a demo, but we were actually trying to get data to work with, we could do this in less than half a dozen mouse clicks, select some campaigns, choose an area, and put in NO2 and filter from 3,000 plus variables down to eight. A single mouse click selects all variables of a common name, so it's one mouse click. And now let's add those to our shopping cart. We call it a little My Variables table, but it's essentially your shopping cart. And we could go back up to the filter by term, and instead of CO, uh, NO2, we could do CO2, let's do carbon dioxide, pick up those variables, select them, add them down to My Variables, and scroll down a little bit. Perfect. And from this table as well, we don't have to go through the details here, but you can choose rows and remove rows and add rows and such. So this is your shopping cart of variables. You're a scientist. You're looking at a particular part of the country. You're looking for particular campaigns. In this particular case, we wanted to pick out NO2 and CO2. So now we have a selection of 12 records that we'd like to um, uh, order from the DAC. So let's go and choose options. When we choose options, it takes that information and slices it in an orthogonal axis. Now it groups them by campaign. And as we hover over the campaigns, we see the variable table update automatically. We could take some campaigns and just exclude them at this point. Um, uh, you can pick a campaign crystal and press X. And uh, that will then disclude the campaign from uh, uh, further work. And you can bring it back in, just you go back and just click the little um, uh, checkbox and we'll bring that back in. Individual variables now listed by PI variable name uh, are displayed. And one can pick and choose which one one wants and add them or remove them or reset and such. Uh, let's go to uh, the options, please, Crystal. What are the options that we could do for uh, this particular set of variables? Uh, we could choose particular flights that we're flowing to collect that data. And as you mouse over the particular flights organized by flight date, we see on the right-hand side uh, the highlight of the flight information that's um, updated. I, I point these little things out to you because we're going to talk in the second part of the talk to the slide deck. How is this done? How do you actually grab that information from one part of a screen and display it on the other part of the screen without doing any page loads or waiting or any of that kind of stuff? If we scroll down just a little bit more, Crystal, we'll get the uh, time base uh, that uh, a PI may have um, uh, uh, set for that collection of variables. These measurement variables that are collected uh, on these platforms Depending on the instrument, they may be collected at different uh, frequencies. For example, they may be a sample once per second, or once every 10 seconds, or once every 30 seconds. And what one would like to do is to take those various samples collected by different instruments and um, uh, synchronize them onto a common time base. And uh, this is a, a part of that selection process. Down the bottom of the page, you can include the vertical profiles or not include the vertical profiles or use a global setting. And let's take a quick peek at the global settings and just see what's involved there. So what would be settings that would apply to all campaigns? And we click on the global tab. Uh, we can set the altitude. We could restrict it to a certain uh, altitude um, uh, uh, above. 3,000 meters below uh, 5,000 meters or what have us. Um, and uh, we see uh, another diagram of uh, the bounding area. Uh, consider numerical time base for all campaigns. That has, has not been overwritten on the options page. And um, some statistical buttons like adding standard deviation and uh, limit uh, of detection. Uh, if we're happy with this, uh, we can review the order. And that will then give us a summary of the orders that we're about to put in for the DAC. And although we won't place this order today, uh, the next step is fire off the order button and send it off uh, to the DAC. So um, uh, this is uh, an example of how we looked at the problem. 
uh, to bring uh, spatial, temporal, and vertical profile uh, selections uh, to the scientist in a manner that uh, you should read no documentation. You don't have to open up any PDFs. If you know how to use an iPhone, you should be able to use the website. And um, uh, with a minimum number of mouse clicks, we try to achieve two things. If you're a power user, we want to get you your data uh, quickly. Um, uh, if you know exactly what you want, and if you don't know quite what you want, there should be a discovery element to this. And the UI should aid in your discovery. It should allow you to go back and forth and add flights or remove flights as you, you select on the data. So for the second part of the talk, uh, um, what we want to talk about is how do we do this? How, how, do you, how do you actually build one of these things? And I'd like to do more than just tell you how we did it. I put together a series of slides such that you could take this almost like a recipe. Not exactly, because we only have about 25 minutes for this uh, particular part of the talk, but you could basically work through these slides and see how these websites are engineered. And uh, I replicate it uh, for other projects, um, uh, maybe not even including uh, airborne data. So uh, let's get started. Chris is going to drive the slides. So I'm going to say next slide on, on each one. Um, and let's do the next slide, Crystal. And for my first Intro slide is the slide of the people. Your people, they, they are the most important asset on, on any uh, project. Nothing happens without them. Um, uh, this work is being led by Dr. Gao Chen. He's the principal investigator. Walking Silverman, uh, the project manager. Uh, Crystal, who's driving the slides. Uh, Crystal Gummo, uh, um, uh, software engineer. And uh, special thanks to Dr. Arlene Fjord of uh, Columbia University working with our alpha and beta test team. And of course, thanks to our prior members most of the work that you're going to see today and discuss today um, has been accomplished uh, in about the last uh, 12 to 15 months. Uh, but there was a fair amount of work done uh, before this, and, and, and that's why they're here, too. Uh, let's hop right into it, the next slide. And it's 7.50 AM. It's on a Monday morning. And your software developer comes into work. She gets a cup of coffee and fires up her computer. And this is what, what she sees. It's small, it's hard to read. Um, uh, one of the ugliest slides perhaps you've seen, it looks like um, kind of hard to tell what kind of computer code that is. There's a mixture of things in there. And, and if you think this looks bad, it's actually, it's actually a lot worse for her because what she sees is on the next slide. When she looks at it, she sees no less than five computer languages all mixed together. There's some PHP, and PHP is a language that runs only on servers. It doesn't run on your, uh, inside your browser. Uh, it doesn't run when you're looking or doing anything on a page. HTML is um, uh, only in your browser. It doesn't do anything on the server at all, but there's no particular logic to HTML. CSS is mostly used for styling, but not only. You can use CSS to position elements on a page. Uh, it changes the flow of elements on the page. SQL is a language back on the server now uh, that's used to um, uh, get database data out of uh, relational databases. Here it's mixed in with PHP. Uh, PostgreSQL is a particular type of dependency for a particular type of SQL. And down the bottom, we see JavaScript, uh, the de facto client-side computer language, actually all mixed in with this, with, with this HTML. It's perhaps worth pointing out here that n nobody did anything wrong here. Uh, in fact, this is how PHP was designed to work. It was actually designed to mix and mush all these languages together. And, and, and it was done that way because in the early 1990s or mid-1990s when PHP was uh, first uh, developed, uh, there really was no other way to bring dynamic, interactive web pages uh, to the browser. Uh, let's go to the next page. Well, our software developer is looking at that. Uh, Dr. Bob Ross, the program manager, adds a very reasonable request. Could you just add a happy little tree that pulls down some data from the CMR and updates the dropdown? That, that seems like a pretty reasonable request. And from Dr. Bob Ross's perspective, uh, it is, but you know, he, he asked that, and, and, and what does our developer see? That's on the next slide. From her perspective, 
what, what exactly do you want me to do? I mean, do you want me to cut the red wire or the blue wire? If I affect the data on the schema, how does that now affect my PHP and business logic? If I try to preserve the schema, uh, what what does and and do things in the business logic? How does that percolate across? It is a a, a difficult problem, and this uh, a difficulty slows down development. It slows down development to a point that it uh, thwarts innovation and makes it increasingly difficult to deliver the type of informatics that we want to deliver. So let's look at a little bit of, uh, at, deeper at the problem, and then we're going to look at the solution. We can look at or observe complexity as an artifact of the domain. Airborne data is complex, uh, in part because of the underlying science captures complex phenomena. Uh, we did not choose our universe. Uh, uh, we didn't choose the nature we live in. Um, airborne uh, 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 chemical species and interactions in the atmosphere is what it is. Uh, and there's a certain basal level of complexity, uh, which is what we seek to understand and that we can do nothing about. But complication, as opposed to complexity, that is a reflection of our human inability to simplify complex phenomena. That is something we can do something about. What makes the prior code complicated is neither syntax nor semantics per se, but the looking of hidden side effects, the unintended consequence of how the various parts interact, especially on the change. Next, next slide. This drives three uh, known concepts in the community. Uh, the first uh, is uh, fragility. That's the propensity for changes in one part of a system to break other seemingly unrelated parts of the same system. And fragility in complicated systems leads to a very reasonable rigidity. That is the resistance to change because of the potential for deleterious unintended consequences. And when we have fragility and rigidity, this tends to lead to technical debt, the accumulated and compounding costs of suboptimal decisions. And there's two important words there. One is compounding. It compounds upon itself, so eventually the debt must get paid down or the uh, tower collapses. And the second is suboptimal. That doesn't, that doesn't mean bad. Nobody made a bad decision. In fact, you may have made excellent decisions at each point in time with the information you had. But the accumulation of decisions, which were the best at the myopic point in time, can still acquire technical debt uh, uh, over the life of the project. So what we think is we're going to spend 80% of our time, money, and resources in development and 20% on maintenance. And, and actually what we often get, and this has been supported by a number of uh, uh, various studies across uh, many years in the uh, software uh, industry, is something perhaps closer to 20% on development and 80% on maintenance. Next slide, please. So how would we do it if we could do it? Uh, there's some pretty standard models out there, and what we want to do is take these standard models, understand them, and then um, apply them the best we can. So uh, at the top part of the slide, uh, we have uh, Mo, Larry, and Curly, and they are each running their own separate instance of a web app. And because they're running a web app in today's world, there are basically three languages that that web app has to be written in. HTML for page structure, or what's called the DOM, the domain object model. CSS, mostly for styling, but, but not all. It has transitions and animation and some positioning. And JavaScript is the main compute language in browsers. We, we don't have much of a choice but to use these three languages if you want to write web applications today. Meanwhile, Shemp, he isn't concerned with web apps at all. He just wants the data. Now, what we want to do when we write an application is we want to service Mo, Larry, and Curly at the same time as we service Shemp without rewriting any code at all. So we want to write this somehow so that what we do for web apps complements what we do for what's called a headless API and vice versa. These calls come down through the internet using standard internet technologies of HTTPS, messaging layer like JSON, and AJAX, which basically means a way for your browser to make a call to get data without it interfering with the way that you interact with the web page. This should come down to a layer of business logic, and the business logic is your 
domain logic. And you have a lot of flexibility now, unlike the top part of the screen, here you have a lot of flexibility in what you write that business logic in. PHP, Python, Node.js, Go, Java, and many other different languages. At the very bottom is a data persistence layer where we actually want the data, and there's an important middle layer between that business logic and that data persistence layer for data models and access objects. That data persistence layer could be persisted under many different technologies. Relational database technologies like MySQL, Postgres or Oracle, or NoSQL technologies like MongoDB, even file systems, in fact, um, one of the most successful pieces of software in the last 20 years, uh, that would be Git, uh, is basically file system based. And even other options uh, like AWS S3. If you go back a little bit to the middle and we look at the data models and objects, there's some dotted lines to show that that particular layer is so important that that layer is usually split between the business logic and the data persistence. Next slide, please. So we can take these three layers and create what's called a classic three-tiered wedding cake architecture. A presentation layer or a front end, a business logic or a middleware, and a data layer. And the first slide we showed of the software developer comes in at just before eight in the morning, these three layers were kind of mixed together and we're gonna to work to separate them. Next slide, please. It's worth pointing out, and I do it in just this one slide here, there's a lot of talk over the last 10 years, five to 10 years of microservices. They're critically important to large enterprises. Nothing we say by making these three horizontal layers is incompatible with microservices, which we could look at as slicing this up vertically. I'm not gonna talk about more about that in this talk, but I think it's worth a slide to point out that while we slice horizontally, uh, uh, we are completely compatible uh, with a microservices approach that then further slice these layers uh, vertically. Uh, next slide, please. So the first thing we wanna do on our three layers is align our talent with our technology. So we can align, let's say Sue, who works on a presentation layer using languages like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Sam can work on the business logic, and he's using PHP today, and Simon, working the data layer, is setting his own databases in SQL. This is not to say that one individual can't do the job at three. Uh, still, all oh, full stack engineer, that's kind of the type of things that full stack engineers do. But by aligning talent with technology, be it either many individuals or a few individuals, it gives us an important step in how to address the technological debt issue. And we're gonna see that in the next slide. While Sue is concentrating on the presentation layer, she's paying attention to new technologies that come in, like SPAs, single page applications. Probably the presentation layer is moving uh, uh, quickest in uh, today's technology turnover. The business logic is moving a little bit slower, but there is some movement in there. So Sam, currently programming in PHP, he wants to get better concurrency, and so he may be looking at a language such as Go. And Simon at the data layer, his requirements may be pushing him to think not just how he can set up his own database in SQL, but should be considering a DAS, that is data as a service. On the next slide. What we want to do is we want to slide out the current technology and slide in a new one of these particular layers. And to slide out, for example, PHP and bring in Go without changing our technologies in the presentation layer of the data layer, we need something to grease between those two layers or act like a, shock, a, a sock between your shoe and your foot. And that grease between the layers is an application programming interface. That is, it is a specification of how the layers interact with each other. And it helps to encapsulate the details that happen within each layer, remain within each layer, and there's simply a flow of information between the layers. On the next slide, we see uh, important, uh, there's an important take home message on this when we talk about APIs, and I think it's worth at least one slide. When we talk about sliding these layers in and out and re replacing a presentation layer with, with um, uh, a new technology, it's a little bit like changing pieces in a puzzle, or a little bit like a lock in a key where you change the key, you have to change the tumbler. It is not like Lego, it's not at the point where one can literally plug out one layer and plug in a new one with no changes. So there's some changes that need to be done 
but what we tried to do is to uh, isolate and encapsulate those changes. Next slide. So let's see what we have here at hand. We have a web app, that is we want a single page application. As we move around the page and do things on the page, we don't want to be pressing buttons that load new pages and take one or two seconds to load. We want high visual connectedness and interactivity. Fast data retrieval on complex geometries, for example, to get the flight tracks or to get tables filtered in certain ways. In this particular app, we wanted map tiling, panning, zoom levels, or the basics that you expect in, some, in a map application. SSO, that's single sign-on authentication using something like URS. And since you're going to be ordering information or ordering data, you want form validation, ordering itself, and we want it to be fast, accurate, robust, reliable. We want it to minimize the cost and inconvenience that the application does for the DevOps engineers on the back end. And hey, it should be done part-time effort and done by yesterday. Next slide. So the first thing we're going to do on this as we begin to drill down is we need to constrain the problem space. And in this space for airborne data, there's three main areas. There is the collection and ingestation of new data from new missions. There's the app itself. And then there's the order processing, the merging of the files, and delivering the data to the user. And next slide. What we did in this and what I'm going to speak to you today is we are going to triage the problem. And so the ingestation of data and new missions and the ordering we're going to put aside and use legacy code for that. And everything we're going to focus on today is just on that center part, just that center part of the app. Next slide. And so we put that wedding cake of a front end, a middleware, and a data right in the middle. Next slide. Let's encapsulate the roles and technologies as we saw in the earlier slides about aligning talent with technology and making it so that we can, in the future, replace one technology with another. We are going to take all user interaction and push that up to the client. What that means is everything you saw in the demo, every update, every mouse click, every rollover, all of that is done without any communication back to our servers. The only thing that changed in the demo was the actual collection of the data. So at certain times, not always clear to the user, that's by design, requests went back to the server to return flight track information or to return the content of the tables themselves. Every other interaction was done client-side, independent, across different browsers, with no communication back to our server. That allowed, allowed us to focus the business logic of the middleware on our server solely to get the data and present the data to the user. And then we push all the data integrity constraints, bring them out of the middleware, push them down to the data layer, and in our case, we use something like uh, uh, SQL. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the front end. Uh, on the next slide, we're going to look at the technology we use for that. Uh, whoops, thank you. Uh, let's talk about this first. No, that's perfect. Let's go to the reactive data slide. Uh, we need a good intro on that. Um, uh, and so on the next slide for reactive data, what has happened in the last five to 10 years? And why is this different from how things used to be done? The notion of reactive data has a very special meaning in the industry. It's systems that are responsive, resilient, elastic, and message-driven. By responsive, it means we want things to happen almost immediately as we interact with the page. This increases user uh, connectedness with the page and uh, um, uh, increases the, um, uh, the user experience. We want systems to be resilient. That is, if something goes down on the back end, there should be something redundant that brings it up or takes its place. Or even better, if something goes down on the back end, uh, you won't know at all, and it will be transparent to the user. Elastic means the ability to spin up and spin down resources as needed. So the closer that we get, perhaps, to a proposal submission time, or the closer we get to the time when data is being imported in, uh, maybe more servers are needed, 
and at other times um, it could be on a daily basis at three in the morning, a weekly basis on Sundays, or seasonal basis uh, uh, in between um, uh, times when uh, uh, major research is done on new data sets. We want to be able to spin down those servers. And message-driven, uh, that's the, um, uh, uh, the concept that uh, data is uh, communicated and the need for data is communicated by short messages between independent components. There's a notion on front end itself about reactive data being just plain JavaScript objects. And, and here in this particular quote, when you modify them to view updates, uh, this is um, very, very uh, uh, new uh, relatively. Um, uh, it used to be if you modified your data, well, you had to modify the view as well and a large part of engineers' time was spent writing the code that when the data changed, the view changed. Uh, and uh, uh, where technology is going today is uh, you just modify the data and the view takes care of itself. And now that we'll see in the next slide. In this particular slide, there's three parts to it, and let me walk you through it in about 60 seconds. On, let's start actually on the right-hand side of the page where it says div, hello world, div. And this is the type of code that your browser is running. And I will tell you right now two things about it. One, to change that message from, to, from saying hello world to hello there is relatively expensive, meaning it takes one or two milliseconds for that operation. On a large page, though, we won't just have one little hello world. This particular hierarchy of elements on the page can be thousands and thousands of elements. And so it is technically unfeasible to update little bits at one or two milliseconds when you have thousands and thousands of them. It would take us one to two seconds or more per update to re-render the page. So there's a problem on the technical side. Now let's go way over to the left-hand side of the page and look at how this is done. We use a technology called View. View abstracts the notion of components. If you are used to programming uh, in HTML and you look at what we've written on the left-hand side of the page, none of that uh, is valid HTML. You can't write it like that. It won't work that way. The data won't get updated that way. So View as a technology abstracts the notion that lets you work with your own components that you mix and match, match and share components. And when you change the data in my data, magically when this is run on the user's browser, the data changes in the view. And this is done by what's in the middle of the page of something called a virtual DOM. The beauty of this virtual DOM is it is transparent to both the developer and to the user. And the virtual DOM makes an in-memory model of what's on the page, and it can be updated very, very quickly. It monitors exactly what parts of the page need to change. So as the data changes, it changes the part of the page. And, and, and that is how we get this kind of very highly interactive approach. A virtual DOM is not the only way to do it. Uh, uh, there's other uh, technologies like uh, Google's Angular. It uses something called an incremental DOM. But basically, it's the same basic idea that there's an in-memory model that is constantly monitoring how data changes and changing just parts of those pages that are needed. If you're an engineer and you, you've been using a jQuery or technologies like that, this completely replaces those technologies 100%. There's zero jQuery uh, in these uh, single-page applications, at least how we describe it here. Next slide, please. And what does all of this cost us? We write that front-end code. Uh, that front-end, it turns out to be about 85,000 lines of code. In fact, there's more code on the front-end than there was for the middle layer and the data layers combined. All of that, though, gets compiled together into a relatively small little packages, yeah, about 420K when it's gzipped. There's about half a dozen chunked files of JavaScript, and there's a little bit of CSS and a little bit of images as well. This is really relatively light, considering what we gain from this, which is that none of this code at all is going to run on our servers. It's what we call a static payload. Can we go to the next slide, please? If you have a static payload, that means we're done with our front-end work. We have completely encapsulated our front-end project. So we can take this, containerize it in a technology called Docker, and put a web server in front of it, like Nginx, 
which will deliver these static files. In fact, this is so computationally cheap to do that the industry calls these kind of deployments serverless. There actually is a server serving out those static files, but there's no page generation. There's no back and forth with the user. Once you get the files once in your browser, then all of the interaction happens in your browser independent of everyone else. Next slide, please. So that means, well, obviously, of course, we can put these uh, um, uh, uh, files um, on ASTC servers in Hampton, uh, Virginia, uh, and save a lot of uh, resources. Um, the bulk of those computational resources uh, don't have to be used to serve these static files. And if you go to the next slide, please. Because the entire front end is just a series of static files, uh, one could distribute it across edge locations uh, across the country or across the world. Uh, we are currently not doing that, um, but Earth Data has its own CDN, Content Delivery Network, and there's no reason why these static files can be pushed out to those edge locations. So people in California get their front end static files uh, from California instead of from Virginia uh, and vice versa. And this can be done across uh, many projects. Next slide, please. So that's the front end. Let's talk about the middleware. On the next slide. And if you go to the next slide. Oh, yeah, let's go back to slide, Crystal. Thank you. Right. This, what is this slide? This slide is, it is a beautiful day. Why is it a beautiful day for PHP engineer? Because all of that front end HTML, CSS, everything else has been completely taken off his or her plate. All of the page generation is gone. All of the back end data, which we'll see, that's also removed. So this business logic engineer needs to do nothing but work in a pure, clean language. So PHP, instead of being a mixture of languages, now becomes a pure scripting language. Same with Go, Python, or what have you. Let's see how we do this on the next slide. Here's how we build a business layer in one slide. Coming in on the left is uh, REST, that's representational state transfer. These are requests that come in through the URLs. They come in through a router. This is not a piece of hardware in your garage or, or by your a, a mo a cable modem. This is a piece of software. We used a framework called Slim Skeleton for PHP. And the router uh, uh, parses the uh, URL. We put it through a middleware filter to kick out requests that have nothing to do with the particular application. So uh, illegal requests or possible malicious requests never even make it to the business logic. The only part of the business logic request that it, that, that code sees are requests that are relevant to it. We then break up that business logic into the areas of the domain that we're working in, we work with campaigns or flight, instruments, orders, and variables. These then work against a common data access layer. We put in an, SQ, an SQL guard to further protect against SQL injection attacks, and that then goes down to a data layer. So our engineer, um, uh, the person working at the business logic level, uh, is not worried about the front end code, not worried about the back end code, simply focuses on the domain logic. Next page, please. That too can get packaged up in a container, a containerization system like Docker, and that too can get served by a web server like Nginx. Here, Nginx gives us something else for our money, in Nginx, we can use what's called a reverse proxy and disk caching. Disk caching means that the first request that comes in to actually get data, so we can't go to the static files, we have to go to the, the middle layer server. We've never seen that request before, so the request goes to the middle layer and data is returned. Nginx intercepts that request and caches it. The next time the same request comes in, either from the same user or a completely different user, Nginx detects that it's already seen the request and then simply serves back that data without the request ever going to the middle layer. So that's taken load off of the middle layer, load off of those servers, and um, uh, again, in increases uh, the uh, performance, overall performance of the system. Next slide, please. Let's hit the data slides, and then we're nearly done. Go to the next slide, please. You may recall I mentioned that um, uh, we had a legacy ingest process. 
and it had produced under the requirements of its project its own database, which was no longer optimized for our need. And as is typical in projects with refactoring, you may not have the, the time or the money to completely redo your um, uh, data schema and your data layer. And in many cases, and in this case, there was no need to, uh, we used what's called a facade pattern where we could build an optimized database on top of the non-optimized one, about 800 plus or minus lines of SQL, fully optimized SQL engine optimization, optimized use and such. Now, at first, this may seem like a little bit of a, uh, a heavyweight solution. Let's go to the next slide, please. It turns out to be not heavyweight at all. Uh, it's about uh, three one-hundredths of a second for the system time to rebuild that database. Maybe looks like about 11 seconds of user time to do it. In fact, these databases are so cheap and so easy to build, you can just build on the fly. And indeed, one can think about the non-optimized data as actually optimized in a generic sense. And then build and spin up optimized databases for particular websites or particular uh, uh, needs uh, as they come up. Let's go to the next slide. So now we have Nginx delivering our static assets, acting as a reverse pro proxy for disk caching. And instead of hosting our own uh, um, uh, SQL, uh, which we could do, uh, we used the ASDC's data as a service. And so this shows how we can we don't all have to play by the same piper. We can mix and match these as we begin to bring these three to the cloud. We need one more thing. Let's look at this on the next slide. And that's the map tile. Somewhere we have to serve maps. NASA has amazing resources in uh, maps. We wanted something uh, simple uh, and uh, easy to deploy. And let's go to the next slide. And on the next slide, for this particular uh, um, uh, project, we chose to do uh, open source maps, um, uh, the open street map uh, uh, collection. Um, and let's go to the next slide. And we use something uh, from Cloakland Technologies, which basically bundles these maps, Nginx, Docker, the whole thing, the tiling, all in one own container with a mounted volume. So this is an example now of how to put up. Uh, we're using an on-premise cloud, uh, Red Hat OpenShift, put up serverless static files, API server for the middle layer, data service to get the data, and in this case, third-party example uh, for, the, um, uh, for the map tiling. Uh, next slide. And this is the last uh, slide of, um, uh, of content. Um, uh, how do we deploy all of this? We can take that entire structure um, uh, of uh, servers and files and what have you. Uh, the source code is in Git. Uh, we write uh, templates for CICD, that is continuous integration and continuous deployment, uh, that when changes happen to the source code, um, one can set up triggers that then pull some Git and deploys everything, uh, in our case, um, to OpenShift as the uh, on-premise cloud. Uh, this is my last content slide. Uh, we, we can go to the next slide, um, uh, which is the ending slide. Uh, I'd thank, like to thank uh, everyone uh, for their time. I'm certainly available for questions. And uh, with this, uh, I'd like to thank Jennifer and hand it back to her. Okay, thank you, Damien. Um, so we do have a couple of uh, end polling questions, and what we'll do is we'll just give those a, a minute or two, um, and then from there we'll move directly to the Q&A period. And we can extend that if there are an abundance of questions to 3.15 p.m. So let's give these just a couple of minutes or so, and then we will transition to the Q&A. All right, thanks, everybody. All right, everybody, we are going to go ahead and move to the Q&A. I don't see very much movement within the uh, polling questions. Oh, there's a couple here. Uh, we give it the 20 more seconds or so, and then we'll move directly um, to the Q&A.
All right, folks, let's go ahead and transition to the Q&A period. And if you have a question, um, please go ahead and type that into the Q&A pod. And uh, I don't see anything right now. Questions? All right, I assume this works for only ASDC data. Could it also be used for any airborne data within the ESDIS stack, either Macon or Damien? I'd be happy to answer that, that question. Um, the website itself is, of course, designed around the airborne data, but otherwise all of the technology is completely data agnostic. The messaging layer between the front end and the business logic is JSON between the business logic and the back end, we're just using SQL. So you could use uh, satellite data uh, or even non-scientific data. Um, it's not specific at all. I will add to that, this is Makan. Uh, once you have the data in the prescribed format that Damien has, it's a, it's a standardized database that he has optimized for this front end. So once you have the data in the database and translated into something that they have created, then yes, uh, the front end can be used uh, as is. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so when we're finished with the q and I will try to pull back up the file sharing pod. So for those of you who are interested, you will be able to download today's presentation files. All right, our next question is, can you discuss a little more on the data output interface. I would be interested in hearing more about cross-mission correlative measurement studies. Makan, would you like to, to answer that? I'm not, I'm not sure I have much to add on that. Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly. Is, uh, do you mean to ask if if we can query cross-mission data from the interface? Is that the question? If the participant could provide additional clarification, that would be useful. Also, Makan, if you could get a little bit closer to the microphone, that would be helpful. Thank you so much. Hey, uh, Jenny, uh, we, we can meet afterwards. I, I can probably uh, take up an uh, uh, offline conversation with you. Absolutely. Yes. So the, the follow-up is that uh, this participant is interested in satellite, airborne, and ground-based mission data. And then I have an additional question as well after this. Okay, our next question is, can you, dis uh, can you discuss more on the data access layer and how you decoupled that from the business logic layer? Yes, cert certainly. So uh, for business logic, we chose to use PHP uh, mostly, mostly for um, legacy reasons. You could use Python or, or whatever you choose. Uh, and then uh, within PHP, we just used the standard um, Postgres uh, drivers. Uh, wanted to use them because they've been community tested and they have protections against uh, injection attacks and other things like that. Um, that also protects against uh, uh, using users' data um, uh, in, in ill-advised ways. Uh, so um, then I wrote uh, the code uh, which um, uh, it takes uh, the user's data, sends it through uh, these um, drivers, and then that then gets uh, just executed uh, in Postgres. And uh, then the response comes back um, uh, in a standard Postgres format, and then that gets mapped into a PHP uh, data model, uh, essentially. Okay, thank you, Damien. So the next question here is, Let me just um, see where we are. What is the advantage of this technical on the air quality modeling?
I don't have a, a direct an answer with that as I'm more on the engineering side uh, than the science side, but um, uh, Makan, uh, would you like to answer that? Uh, I, I think the question pertains to like, uh, how does this technique of doing things or acquiring the data or downloading the data help with the air quality modeling, uh, if, if, if I assume that, that's the nature of the question. So, um, so, so the interface uh, allows you to do merge data. So when you're doing studies like air quality modeling, you do need data from different resources, different PIs, different instruments. And since all those instruments capture data at different spatial and temporal resolution and sampling size, this interface provides you with the capability of merging the data together from various sources. So if you're doing an air quality modeling kind of study, I think you can download the data that is consistent with your model that you are working with. For example, if your model is doing like five minutes or hourly uh, uh, time stepping, uh, you, you can query the data from this interface with that uh, time interval and uh, query the data across missions, so I, I think, if that was your question. Does that provide additional clarification for our participants? All right, let's take a look and see if there are any additional questions. Okay, Daniel, go for it. So while we're waiting for um, the additional question, uh, once we log off from the audio component, what I will do is I will pull back up the file sharing pod. And so for those of you who are interested in downloading either uh, Damien's presentation from today or uh, Makan's presentation from today, you'll be able to do so. And uh, what we'll do is we'll leave the virtual meeting space open for an additional 10 minutes. So certainly if you think of something, um, please feel free to uh, type those into the Q&A pod. And any questions that were not answered during the framework of the webinar will be forwarded to our speakers and they can follow up offline with you. Let's take a look and see if our next question. Okay, great. So the, the next question is, realistically, how long would it take to put together a data system from scratch? How many persons on the team, et cetera? I, I think that's an excellent question. Um, I can give you some good data on that. It took me about six months to write the business logic, um, essentially from, from scratch. Uh, um, another six months to do the uh, front end uh, view work. So that's about a year of uh, part-time work. I think you should then add um, another six months of part-time work uh, for cloud deployment and beta testing and everything else and round it out with another. So we're looking there, that will be two years of maybe one half FTE, three quarters FTE, up to one FTE. Uh, I think this could be done in a small and tight team, uh, two to three people, um, if you cover your major basis, your, your major technology stack. Um, so I hope, uh, hope that helps. Well, thank you, Damien. All right. Yes, that was a helpful answer. All right. Are there any additional questions? All right, let's take a look, everybody. We'll give it a minute or so, and if I'd like to thank our speakers today, uh, Makan Verdi, as well as Damian Gessler and Crystal Gummo for driving the live demonstration and the slides um, this afternoon. We appreciate all of you listening in today. And uh, let's give it one more check for any final thoughts or questions. All right, everybody, if there are no further questions, then we are going to log off from the audio component and we'll leave the virtual meeting space open. If you think of something, feel free to enter it in. I'll pull back up the file sharing pod. And within a couple of days of completion, so 
um, certainly by the end of this week, I will send out a link to the direct recording, a direct link to the recording so that you can um, take a look at this again at your own leisure. All right, I'm seeing nothing further. Do any of our speakers have any final commentary? Uh, no, except to uh, thank everybody. I thank you very much uh, for attending today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share with you. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, uh, check out the EOS uh, at uh, NASA uh, LARC website. That's the ASTC website for more data on different missions. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, everybody.